विश्व की अर्थव्यवस्था में पांचवें नंबर पर पहुंच चुके हैं 8 करोड़ लोगों ने नया कारोबार शुरू किया है और 8 करोड़ लोगों ने कारोबार शुरू किया है तो नहीं हर कारोबारी ने एक या दो एक या दो लोगों को रोजगार दिया है ये भारत न रुकता है ये भारत न थकता है ये भारत न हाफता है और न ही ये भारत हारता है दुनिया के किसी भी टेबल पर मेक इन इंडिया चीज हो तो दुनिया को विश्वास होना चाहिए इससे बेहतर दुनिया में कुछ नहीं हो सकता है ये अल्टीमेट होगा विमेन सेल्वेल ग्रुप के साथ आप गांव में जाएंगे तो आपको बैंक वाली दीदी मिलेगी आपको आंगनबाड़ी वाली दीदी मिलेगी आपको दवाई देने वाली दीदी मिलेगी और अब मेरा सपना है दो करोड़ लखपति दीदी बनाने का जब देश आजादी के सौ साल मनाएगा उस समय दुनिया में भारत का तिरंगा झंडा विकसित भारत का तिरंगा झंडा होना चाहिए चुनो चुनौती सीना तान चुनो चुनौती सीना तान जग में बढ़ाओ देश का नाम for a very good morning and a very happy independence day to all of our viewers those were visuals of the prime minister from the ramparts of the red fort now the indian flag should be seen as a flag of a developed nation in 2047 uh, when india completes a 100 years of independence that's the vision that prime minister modi laid down for india at his independence day address from the red fort now this is his last independence day speech before the 2024 lok sabha elections however the prime minister in his 90 minute address sounded confident about retaining power for the next term joining me is also my colleague uh, subhi upadhyay from the mumbai studio uh, subhi that was a 90 minute speech with a lot of takeaways uh, not just for the country at large but for the industry to be specific as well Oh absolutely lots of references to some of the programs that are already in the works some of the big pushes like semiconductor for instance uh, and a lot more and we will talk about that uh, hi ashmit great to you know join you on the show and a very very happy independence day to all our viewers as well well the prime minister did revisit a lot of the steps taken by his government in the last 10 years while also laying out the vision for the future the prime minister lauded his government's policies to empower women tackle climate change and promised to fight corruption and end dynasty and appeasement politics the prime minister also spoke about the manipur violence saying india stands with the people of manipur and that the situation is slowly improving in the state he uh, in his concluding remarks the prime minister urged indians to tap the opportunity to live for the nation and take the country to greater heights We'll discuss more about the Prime Minister's vision and the roadmap to reach there. I'm now joined by Mr. R. Dinesh, uh, President of the Confederation of Indian Industries, the CII. He's also the Executive Vice Chairman of TVS Supply Chain Solutions. Uh, Mr. Dinesh, thank you so much for joining us for being a part of this uh, special broadcast. Uh, first question: The Prime Minister has clearly laid out his vision. Vision 2047 is what we're calling it. This vision, where the Prime Minister hopes we'll uh, transform into a developed country, into an advanced economy. He's aiming for being the third largest economy as we celebrate our hundred years of independence. Uh, just looking at that 90-minute address, when you look at this roadmap. what according to you in your view in your assessment uh, is the takeaway for the private sector for the industry uh, from this road map from that 90 minute speech thank you so if you look at it i think it's a complete i would call it balanced approach to how the economy has to work right industry is not going to work independent of how the economy is developing so if i look at it i think one the perfect platform or the base which has now been laid i think it's a question of how do we use it to grow and become or achieve this vision of becoming a developed nation by 2047 i think from cii side or from industry side i think the opportunities are now humongous i think the focus on whether it is the infrastructure whether it is the balanced development of the tier 2 tier 3 towns of course the focus on the manufacturing sector and the various policies which enable us i would call it be perfectly placed for future growth is how i would look at it so what are the specific opportunities i think i am not really focusing on what has been said in the address 
but everywhere cutting across, whether it be the manufacturing sector, the Make in India for the rest of the world, uh, being part of the global supply chains, and most importantly, uh, being the fastest growing economy or fastest growing large economy in the world, I think is how I look at this as a takeaway. Sure, Mr. Joshi. Uh, let me also ask you a supplementary question. In fact, this is something uh, that Mr. Joshi, who joined us from Crystal a few minutes back, pointed out that it could be trending viral on social media in very few minutes. Uh, was a statement that the Prime Minister made with respect to the middle class. He said that uh, in the last few years, 13.5 crore people have left poverty uh, to enter the middle class. Now, this statement by the Prime Minister is also backed by a recent study by the SBI, uh, where the research paper says that by 2047, we're looking at a weighted mean income of about 50 lakh rupees per annum. Uh, just looking at these numbers in terms of the middle class and the demand potential going forward, uh, when you look at it from an industry perspective. Yeah, so I actually call that the cusp of the virtuous cycle. What do I mean by that? It means that our consumption or our demand, the domestic demand, enables more and more uh, focus on India. And that obviously results in significant uh, inward investments, which again then propels the economic growth. So I would call it the starting point, or not a starting point, I would call it the midpoint of the uh, virtuous cycle, which then results in significantly further opportunities for cutting across all sectors. So whether it be the uh, rural growth, whether it be the ability to make sure that we harness the uh, remote corners of the country and making them available for all the products and services which are uh, currently available across. I think those are all the opportunities which we will see going forward before because of this expansion in the uh, middle class reach. The second is obviously the spending power then attracts, as I said, the best in class products. And I think the prime minister very clearly outlined that he would love to see an Indian product present across the world in every sector in which we are present, which again is uh, also an outcome of, I would call it, the domestic uh, demand driving up the ability to be best in class. Mm. Uh, Mr. Dinesh, uh, good morning. Uh, so, so let's just talk about uh, some of the strides that have already been uh, made in this regard and of course the work that needs to be done. So the manufacturing has got a huge push. Uh, you know, current policies say that the stock market has been really rewarding that. We've seen what's been happening to a lot of the defense manufacturers. CapEx has picked up in a big, big manner in the budget this year. I mean, the CapEx outlay was uh, was also doubled. So in, in your sense, uh, uh, you know, how much have we, you know, covered in terms of the path to this, uh, this destination of becoming a developed economy? And what are the next immediate steps that uh, we need to keep in mind? Okay, so, I mean, you are perfectly right. I think if you look at the past, and I would say past at least the last three years, the significant focus on making sure that, okay, let me look at it in two different buckets. One is what I would call the ease of doing business. I think the government's first focus was on ease of doing business. I would say in the last three years, it has been on cost of doing business. A perfect combination of ease of doing business and cost of doing business then sets us up to become a developed economy or have the ability to become a developed economy by 2047. And if you again look at what needs to be done, I think it's just making sure we continue this path of progress. Of course, there would arise certain issues. I mean, nobody expected a COVID event or nobody expected a, a geopolitical crisis to come up, which does affect India because we are all integrated into the global economy. As we navigate our way through these issues, I believe the core focus on what we need to do on these two aspects, the ease of doing business and the cost of doing business, is something which has been the continued focus. If you look at from a CIS perspective, I think we had also outlined that just the continued focus on this with specific areas of making sure we continue the decriminalization, we make sure that we work with the uh, investment of the private sector into the right channels of, I would call it, the new age sectors like renewables, et cetera. All of those would be the next steps to happen. But I, going back to your statement, I think these two are the core pillars on which I believe the uh, country will uh, march towards becoming a developed economy. Okay, so let me probe a little more. Ease of doing business and cost of doing business. Let me actually take up the second, uh, you know, with respect to costs. Even the Prime Minister alluded to that, that uh, we unfortunately do end up in for importing inflation. And that's, for instance, a concern. Uh, what more do you think uh, can be done? What would industry like to see when it comes to improving the cost of doing business? 
So I think, uh, I mean, uh, coming from the supply chain sector, I think if I look at it, uh, obviously, uh, from a manufacturing perspective, supply chains become a core focus. Cost of logistics, cost of uh, uh, managing the supply chains is very important. If I look at that, the infrastructure spend, I would say, is the one pillar of making sure that the cost comes down. And I, I don't need to repeat figures. I think all of us are aware of the significant focus which has happened in terms of the infrastructure and the continued focus, which I think we have continuously uh, supported and applauded. The second is making sure that we are able to digitally integrate all of this. And I think the Gatishakti program is a perfect example of that. And maybe India is the only country which has actually developed these 36 layers of visibility cutting across uh, the country and the states and the various regions. And I'm told it is even going to extend further to even the panchayats, et cetera. So that kind of a digitalization uh, ability is what I think India actually brings, not just to our country, but also as a solution for other parts of the world as well. So that's the second focus on the cost of doing business. Third, and which is obviously not something which we can work only with the center on, but we have to work across the country, is how do we make sure that we further integrate the solutions which we are looking at from the central level at the state's level as well. So I think these are the three big buckets I would call on the cost of doing business. Sure. Uh, Mr. Dinesh, let me follow up on that issue of supply chains. Uh, when we talk of supply chains, when we talk of manufacturing here in the country, India, uh, not just manufacturing for India, but also exporting to the world, uh, there are a couple of issues that often come up in our conversations with the industry. One is uh, the data, uh, the tariffs that we charge on various import, imported inputs. That's one. The other concern that often comes up is an example of that we saw very recently uh, was with respect uh, to restrictions being imposed on goods uh, that are being imported. We saw recently for laptops, uh, PCs, etc. Uh, is this something that we perhaps need to resolve internally to exude confidence when we're pitching ourselves to be a part of the global uh, supply chains? Uh, see, the way I would look at it is this is a very responsive government. And I think whenever we see issues, I think uh, they continue to make sure our work to make that change happen. So if I step back and look at this in that context, I would say, yes, there could be issues in terms of specific sectors or specific uh, areas where we may want to improve. But I'm very confident that not only will the response be fast, but that also the solutions will be found because the continued thrust on the, as you said, the, uh, by making India the manufacturing hub is not going to change. And uh, I would call it, even if there are any minor issues on the way, I think both from a CIA perspective and from industry perspective, I think there is a confidence that uh, it will happen and happen very quickly. Having said that, I think the way I would look at is, if we are looking at ourselves as an export destination, like I said, there is also going to be a focus on making sure the domestic uh, demand is being fulfilled by many of these manufacturers who are coming here. And obviously we wish to be the cutting state of technology. So I don't see that focus in any way being hindered by what we may call as issues at the ground, which will need to be continuously resolved. It's not that they're not there, but we will continue to resolve them. Sure. Uh, just shifting focus, Mr. Dinesh, if I can ask you another question, and this is on a very different domain. This is on the issue, issue of women empowerment. Uh, India is hosting the G20 presidency, and as a part of that presidency has placed this issue right in the middle of the agenda in terms of women empowerment. Uh, we've had plenty of conversations in the last few weeks and months to understand how this can be achieved. Your take on how the private sector can help achieve this in terms of women empowerment, not just in terms of tokenism, uh, in terms of maybe a representative on the board, but rather participation as a part of the broader workforce. See, every study has actually proven that uh, in, I mean, the country, the company, and in a way, every business actually gets benefited by making sure we have the more and more women, uh, not just involved, but as you said, fully employed and uh, fully involved in the business in a day-to-day -day basis. So if you look at it from CIS perspective, I think we have been continuously working on this in making sure that we have uh, the skill development done for the, them to become part, the women to become part of the daily employment. And cutting across levels, and I think that's the most important point, like you said, it is not regarding just being part of a governance mechanism, but actually being fully employed on a regular basis in every sector. And I don't remember the data offhand, but I do know that there has been a significant growth happening 
And again, cutting across sectors, whether it be starting from supply chain or logistics to manufacturing, and we know of factories and places where we have 100% women employed, and they have been actually most productive in terms of uh, giving the delivery mechanism. So it is, I, I don't think it's a question of any tokenism. I think it's well realized, well practiced, and I think it's more a question of doing more of the same to make sure that we have a larger uh, share of the workforce and uh, also uh, I would call it higher level of skill available for the uh, rural women, et cetera, to be employed and employable immediately. And that's cutting across all sectors, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean manufacturing or one specific sector. Mm, okay. Uh, Mr. Dinesh, just coming back to the uh, aspect of ease of doing business. Now, I think uh, defense is one space where uh, a lot of members of industry seem to be, uh, you know, uh, quite enthused with the steps that have been taken. We were speaking to, uh, you know, uh, Baba Kalyani of uh, Bharat Forge just the other day. And for instance, he gave us an anecdote as to how for him, uh, you know, personally, he's not seen uh, uh, policy makers come around to really uh, help out and, you know, propel the manufacturing process so, so much. I mean, of course, uh, you know, the Kalyani group is very big on defense. But, you know, in terms of ease of doing business, what else would you like to see? Or which are the other focal points, sectoral focal areas, uh, where CII would want to see the government put more emphasis? No, I think we did speak about, uh, I mean, you are right. I mean, defense is a classical example of how, uh, you know, the evolution has taken place where uh, the sector has benefited. And even to that extent, I would say uh, sectors like supply chain, sectors like uh, um, the uh, associated sectors of manufacturing have all benefited from that. But I would say the make core focus for uh, from the government perspective and from CIS perspective is making sure that the full value chain, the MSME side and the businesses which are linked with the larger businesses are fully supported and enabled to grow. And that's something which I think uh, I would say the COVID actions which the government took and the post that how we are integrating them into the global supply chains is has been and is one of the core focus. The second aspect of it is with regard to uh, the decriminalization laws. And I think that's something which is also work in progress. And we believe that's something which will help and make sure that the ease of doing business is further strengthened. And I know this has been discussed at the highest level in the government, again, a core focus area for CII and for everybody across cutting across. I would say these are the two main areas where I would see significant thrust happening and where that benefit of it can also help us going forward. So Mr. Dinesh, we've discussed a lot about the, the efforts from the government side, policy and all that needs to, you know, uh, uh, needs to be put in place to create that enabling environment. Let's talk about private capex because that's been the big ask as well, right? When the animal spirits start firing away, that's when perhaps we can realize some of these dreams. So where are we on the cycle, on the private capex front? And uh, what do you see ahead, say, in the next uh, 12 to 18 months? So I think actually uh, we had released uh, the uh, kind of, you know, where we are on the spending side. And if I remember right, the data was we are now close to 80% on sectors like uh, chemicals, on cement, on uh, steel, et cetera, and also well above 75% in most of the other sectors. And uh, while we don't have the immediate data, I think what we have seen as this is now cutting across almost all sectors. So, and as we know, once it crosses between 70 to 80%, you are going to see that CapEx coming in and being spent. And as we speak today, I am 100% confident that within the next uh, two quarters, you will actually see it happening at the ground level. I, again, anecdotally, I'm hearing that happening, but you will see the data coming out to confirm that. So I think it's a question of, we have had, I would call it different shocks and different uh, elements of uh, uh, surprises which none of us were prepared for and we are now come out of that and we see very clearly India emerging as the high growth uh, market in the world. Therefore, I don't see any reason why uh, the private capex will be hesitating to spend once this demand continues or as we see today, which is 75-80% capacity utilization. Uh, sure, Mr. Dinesh. Let's talk headwinds now. One of the headwinds, uh, red flagged as a part of this 90-minute speech, uh, was inflation. I just want to get your reading uh, that as far as inflation is concerned, is it predominantly imported inflation or are we also looking at domestic triggers? And irrespective of whether it's imported or domestic, 
do you see the RBI rate cycle achieving that objective of tempering the inflation? Or is it time that we start asking that question about how perhaps maybe a reversal may be in the need? Actually, one minute I would like to step back and if I compare India with the rest of the world, I would actually say that India has done significantly better than most parts of the world. And wherever uh, you know businesses have been present in different geographies, I think all of us will confirm that India has done very well. And I would say kudos to RBI for actually managing it. And of course, industries ask will always be that you know, uh, you know, pause moves to uh, benign. But having said that, the data hasn't yet come. And I think the RBI governor has been very clear in stating that he needs to see the data because inflation does harm not just uh, the common man, but also industry and across the board. Therefore, uh, I would not look at this as India's headwind. I think it's a world's headwind out of which India has done uh, better than most parts of the world. So for us, I think we, we have to wait and watch to see what is happening in the rest of the world before we can decide to come in with a very strong recommendation on reversing, et cetera, as the case may be. And like I said, it's an articulated policy. So I think we have to wait to see the data before we can go back uh, to make that recommendation. All right, uh, Mr. Dinesh, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much for uh, taking out the time and being with us uh, on this occasion. Wish you a very happy Independence Day as well. Thank you, and all of you too. Um, thank. thank you. We'll take a quick break on that note, but don't go anywhere because on the other side, we'll be joined by Sanjeev Puri, President Designate at CII, in just a bit. Well, a very good morning and a very happy 77th Independence Day to all of our viewers. We are, as a part of this special broadcast, we're reflecting on, of course, the big speech that came from the Prime Minister from the ramparts of the Red Fort. And joining me uh, for this conversation is my colleague, Surbhi Padhyay, from the Mumbai studio. Uh, Surbhi, no big announcement, but there are plenty of cues that the Prime Minister has given as a part of his Vision 2047. Oh, absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, references to a lot of the key focus areas for the government and for the economy, sunrise sectors like uh, renewables, like, of course, semiconductor and much more. Well, let's take the conversation forward. We have uh, Sanjeev Puri, president designated CII, joining in. He's also the chairman and managing director of ITC. Thank you very much for joining us, Mr. Puri. And let me start by wishing you a very happy Independence Day. Thank you for inviting me and a very happy Independence Day to you and all the viewers. Thank you so much. So, Mr. Puri, let's get uh, straight away down to it. What did you think of the speech? What did you think were the highlights? And more importantly, uh, you know, what do you think are the, the critical uh, sort of, uh, you know, milestones ahead that we need to cross if we are to achieve this ambitious target of uh, turning into a developed economy by 2047? So, first of all, uh, the speech was very clearly inspirational, very clear vision, Vikshit Bharat by 2047, uh, I thought that the uh, there was great clarity on the roadmap for inclusive and sustainable growth. And uh, it was, in fact, reinforcing and reiterating the commitments and the actions that have one has already seen on the ground. And there are great examples of that. I, I think these include the investments in infrastructure, the investments not only in the physical, but uh, the, the uh, digital infrastructure, the investments around the, the aspect of sustainability, the focus on sunrise sectors, the focus on youth and uh, women empowerment, the focus on holistic development, so that you know the benefits also reach uh, those who need it through the direct benefit uh, scheme, and a deep commitment for the mantra of reform, perform, and transform. So all in all, I, I think it was very inspirational and, and uh, great clarity on the roadmap ahead. And also, it's aligned to whatever was kind of... Uh... Ah, I think we've just lost that link with uh, Mr. Puri. 
we'll try and uh, get that line back up. But uh, indeed, uh, as Mr. Puri was saying, those were some of the highlights of uh, Prime Minister Modi's speech, where he touched upon various aspects, right from uh, you know getting drones to uh, women self-help groups uh, so that they can literally you know make better use of that technology in agriculture to uh, putting the spotlight on sunrise sectors like renewables, like uh, electric vehicles, and of course, semiconductors as well. So there was, uh, and there was of course a lot of focus on the middle class. Uh, the Prime Minister alluded to the fact that tax rates have been lowered. He alluded to how uh, over uh, 13 crore people, 13 and a half crore people have come out of the poverty line. They have risen above the poverty line and have now entered India's middle class. So Ashmit, I think these were some of the highlights. Uh, th I, I think the, the, this time the speech was uh, tilted more in favor of the forward-looking agenda than only recapping some of the, you know, the big policy achievements of the government, so to speak, and, uh, you know, the confidence that he would want to come back and, uh, you know, perhaps finish and inaugurate a lot of the programs that the NDA has started. Well, clearly, uh, w w one thing that was clear as a part of the speech is that he's not looking at uh, a two-year window or a five-year window. He's looking at a multi-decadal view. He's looking at 2047. Uh, that's the roadmap that he's uh, setting. He's expressing confidence. He's expressing uh, confidence in ensuring that continuity between now uh, and the next general election. So he's quite clear as far as his, his agenda is that uh, in terms of pushing the country forward, in terms of uh, leading this growth, in terms of achieving that objective of Vision 2047. In fact, one of the issues uh, where there has been considerable success has been the Digital India uh, mission. That has uh, realized very many aspirations. There are The India stack is very clearly developed. The Indian government is pitching it uh, to very many takers as a part of the G20 conversations. There has been some amount of uh, curiosity as well in terms of a lot of interest being shown for solutions such as the UPI, such as DigiLoka, uh, the solutions that we had with respect to COVID. So clearly there's a lot of focus there. Uh, the question now is that we've seen considerable success on the software front. Are we shifting our focus? The, shift, uh, sh the focus is clearly on manufacturing. What are we doing to realize those aspirations? Uh, we've seen the PLI push. There's been a significant push uh, coming in from the government, uh, rolling out the red carpet, ensuring uh, that there are incentives on offer, uh, competing with geographies such as Vietnam and Thailand. Uh, but there is still a lot of work to be done, just like we had our previous conversation where Mr. Mohindru was pointing out that there is work to be done if you want to compete against the likes of uh, Vietnam, Thailand, Mexico, which already have a a big lead, a big heads up when compared to the Indian manufacturing market. Uh, so again, uh, Surbhi, that will be very interesting to see how the private sector responds to this in terms of private capex. We've seen the government mm -hmm. trying to put its best foot forward, but it's even coming out with PLI schemes, incentives. Uh, but the weight now is on the private sector. Yep. Will the private sector be able to take this load? Will be able to uh, finance these aspirations? So that will be something interesting to watch. In fact, uh, as and when Mr. Puri joins us, it will be interesting to get his insight sure. uh, on uh, his assessment of how the PLI journey has been so far and mm -hmm. what is required to take it forward. Oh, absolutely. Well, uh, you know, let's take a quick break. And before we take that break, let's leave our viewers with some of the highlights of the Independence Day speech uh, that was delivered by the Prime Minister today from the ramparts of the Red Fort. Take a look. विश्व की अर्थव्यवस्था में पांचवें नंबर पर पहुंच चुके हैं आठ करोड़ लोगों ने नया कारोबार शुरू किया है और आठ करोड़ लोगों ने कारोबार शुरू किया है तो नहीं हर कारोबारी ने एक या दो एक या दो लोगों को रोजगार दिया है ये भारत न रुकता है ये भारत न थकता है ये भारत न हाफता है और न ही ये भारत हारता है दुनिया के किसी भी टेबल पर 
मेक इन इंडिया चीज हो तो दुनिया को विश्वास होना चाहिए इससे बेहतर दुनिया में कुछ नहीं हो सकता है ये अल्टीमेट होगा डिमेंस हेल्थ वेल्थ ग्रुप के साथ आप गांव में जाएंगे तो आपको बैंक वाली दीदी मिलेगी आपको आंगनवाड़ी वाली दीदी मिलेगी आपको दवाई देने वाली दीदी मिलेगी और अब मेरा सपना है दो करोड़ लखपति दीदी बनाने का जब देश आजादी के सौ साल मनाएगा उस समय दुनिया में भारत का तिरंगा झंडा विकसित भारत का तिरंगा झंडा होना चाहिए चुनो चुनौती सीना तान चुनो चुनौती सीना तान जग में बढ़ाओ देश का नाम Welcome back here with this special coverage, India at 76, and we have uh, Mr. Puri back with us. Mr. Puri, we, we, the line got disconnected over there. Uh, you were making a point, and we were discussing what needs to be done, both from a government policy standpoint and the corporate sector standpoint, uh, as we try and you know put our best foot forward to achieve this vision of becoming a developed country by 2047. Yes, absolutely. And uh, you know the uh, what was very encouraging is to note that the <clears throat> the path and the and the areas were well articulated i i think with the whole mission of perform reform and transform and looking at all the uh, de bottlenecking all the enablers that can transform the economy was a good positive be it infrastructure the physical the digital be it sustainability and 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 the unique initiative of life in sustainability be it empowerment at the grassroots level through direct benefit transfer, be it holistic development, whether it's water connections, electricity connections, empowering the youth and the women, and the focus on technology, 
I think it's it's all the right areas that will make this economy into a higher trajectory of growth. Now, I, I think the real mantra is really to be consistently executing on that. I think all the elements are there. And we've seen reasonable amount of progress in the recent past. Okay. Uh, so if I could follow that up by uh, getting your sense on the sectors, uh, Mr. Puri. I mean, in the last, I think, 12 to 15 months, railways and defense have become pretty much the poster boys of, uh, you know, the way the CapEx cycle is turning, the way uh, policy and, uh, you know, uh, the private sector seem to be coming together. Uh, what are the next areas? For instance, semiconductor seems to be a huge push. There are PLI schemes in a couple of sectors. But, you know, in, in the near future, uh, where do you think industry will also put a greater emphasis and focus? So, you, you, you've called up some very important sectors and, and there's a lot of focus on those sectors. But besides that, at a larger, uh, you know, perspective, I think capacity utilizations have certainly improved. And I think the corporate balance sheets, the uh, health of the financial system is is quite, uh, is very good right now. Credit is available. I think the corporate income tax also that was reduced makes investments uh, more attractive. I think what is, and, and we are seeing the green shoots of investments coming in across sectors. And, and I can say for our own company also, we've been uh, investing. Now, I think what is really uh, the risk and what may be holding back to some degree is really the risks from the external sector. As you know, exports are, are, are not doing well, and, and that's because the, uh, uh, the developed economies and even China also, the growth rates have kind of uh, uh, been structurally lower. So that's, that's really the challenge. But I'm quite optimistic that over time, uh, investments will start and it will be a more broader and uh, sharper investment cycle because all the enablers are in place and the sectors that that need to uh, transform really is around manufacturing and we are seeing uh, not only the electronics but there are pli schemes to look at besides the the newer newer sectors also the sectors that can create large economic multipliers there is the sector on uh, you know the food processing for example then uh, uh, the, la the last budget of the finance minister also spoke about giving a thrust to tourism by developing uh, 50, uh, you know, uh, centers of excellence. And tourism actually has a large economic multiplier too. And, and with the uh, stature that India has on the global, uh, global stage today, the rising stature, and the exposure that everybody has got to various facets and diversity of India through G20, I think it's, it's really going to also boost uh, uh, tourism as far as uh, India is India is concerned. So that's another sector, and there's also been uh, you know a lot of focus on the agriculture sector, which is the lifeline of the economy. It's a sector which nearly half the workforce is employed, and there's a lot of thrust through FPOs bringing technology into that sector. I think multiple sectors need to really uh, transform for India to holistically transform. And I think many of these areas are uh, being addressed. Of course, it's a journey. Things will not happen overnight. But I, I, I do believe that we are taking steps in the right direction. And uh, once we consistently do it, and I'm quite hopeful that that will happen and, and all these gets executed, things will uh, uh, progress. Uh, Mr. Puri Ashmit here from the Delhi studio. The question I want to ask is, you mentioned the PLI. PLI clearly designed uh, to give a push, push towards manufacturing. Uh, what was also the, on the government's agenda is to follow the South Korean model, is to have this PLI uh, develop Indian champions that can then compete on the global stage. Now, if one were to take uh, electronics manufacturing, uh, there has been a fair amount of growth in terms of uh, production and exports, but not really seeing Indian champions coming up uh, that will take the weight of... Uh, uh, Vision 2047. How do we change that? How do you uh, develop Indian brands, Indian companies uh, that can take on the mantle of this uh, development agenda that the Prime Minister has set out? So, uh, I, I let me make two points on that. First of all, let's recognize it's going to be a journey. It's not going to happen overnight, right? Uh, number two, I think the area where we need to uh, increase investments is on research and development. India is just about 0.7% and we need to at least double it. And that's an area where the, the uh, you know, institutes of research and uh, uh, education 
and 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 private sector needs to come together to deepen research and i think some enablers have also been put in place in this budget but that's an area that a lot more focus needs to be put a lot more focus i think needs to be put by private sector also in ramping up uh, development of uh, uh, intellectual property so these are the two areas these are the two points i would like to make as far as this is concerned Uh, let me also ask you a follow-up question, uh, Mr. Puri, and this is with respect to the legal framework we have in place. We have been talking uh, for, for, for very many years now on alternate dispute resolution, on enforceability of awards, on the time taken by the judiciary to decide on uh, corporate litigation, on tax disputes. How urgent is the need felt by the industry to address some of these issues going forward, uh, given that the government is the largest litigant? So... Uh Definitely, ease of doing business is is very important. Very important, not only for uh, you know industry in India, also from a perspective of uh, attracting foreign investment. And uh, though we have made uh, progress in in many areas, I think the area you called out is an area that uh, certainly needs uh, attention, and it is uh, it is uh, important. There are certain steps happening in certain sectors, but I, I but I do believe that there is a lot more that. Uh, uh, needs to be done in this sector. Yeah. Mm, okay, uh, Mr. Puri, you, you mentioned the risks and the external sector as being one of them, given uh, the fact that you know exports of that trajectory has been a little wobbly uh, because of the way demand is shaping up in some of the Western economies. Uh, overall, if we leave aside the uh, you know uh, the issues from the external demand perspective, and if we look uh, look at uh, you know our export position from the internal supply perspective. Then uh, how does it look? I mean, I'll just quote a Morgan Stanley uh, research note. But they say that they're expecting merchandise exports, not services, merchandise exports to show uh, CAGR compounding growth of about 12% uh, over the next several years. Uh, does that sound ballpark right or is it a bit of an ambitious target to have at this point? Well, I think I think we have potential of doing more than that. <laughs> and uh, because we, we do have uh, the right enablers, the policy frameworks, I think, as I explained to you, the corporate position is much better. The financial sector is much better. And uh, we do have the talent, the skilled manpower available in the country. So we can certainly do it. The, the, challenge, the challenge right now is really the fact that there is, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, stress in as far as demand is concerned in the external sector. And that is coming in the way. But certainly, I do believe the potential is there. And uh, equally on services, I think there is far more potential than we have uh, harnessed so far because India has the great demographic advantage, which is uh, a challenge in many parts of the world. Mm. And India has that uh, great advantage. And services too, I think, has got a lot more potential than what we have achieved so far. Sure, absolutely. You mentioned tourism. And yes, we, we are well aware of that and uh, the heights uh, and you know, the, the ways the stock market is looking at a lot of the tourism-related businesses, uh, obviously ITC's hotels business included, where the demergers finally happened. That's, of course, big, big news. Uh, so, you know, uh, in, in terms of uh, risks, let me ask you if I could you know, throw in one more potential risk. Could populism be one of them? We are moving into an election year uh, in 2024. How do you see that big event and, uh, you know, whatever impact it may have on the overall policy framework? See, if you if you talk about risks, to my mind, uh, there are there are really two very important risks. Mm -hmm. One is of course the external sector, and the second is the climate emergency, right? And uh, we are all uh, 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 the globe world is focused a lot on decarbonisation, and India is doing well. India has taken a leadership position. I think the area where uh, where 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 a lot more needs to be done. Uh, across the world is really the bit on adaptation because we, you know, all, all indications are an IPCC report says that temperatures will breach 1.5 degree, which means multiplying extreme weather events. So how do we learn to live in a world with greater amount of extreme weather events? That, to my mind, is a big risk. You know, for example, inflation is a, is a risk. And, and one of the areas of inflation is really, you know, food inflation, for example. So that that uh, that is the risk. As far as uh, the point on populism you made, I, I think there is evidence as far as the last budget is concerned, and uh, we saw that the budget was very growth oriented. The budget was very 
uh, very focused on creating the right enablers for the economy to pursue a path of sustainable and inclusive growth. And it was very evident in the budget. So uh, let, me, let me stop there, I think. Right, Mr. Puri, we're almost out of time. I'll, I'll save uh, a comment from you for uh, a final wrap as far as uh, the Independence Day programming is concerned. So a quick word to you. You've highlighted the risks. You've highlighted the challenges. Uh, what, according to you, perhaps are three key recommendations or suggestions that you would like uh, to make uh, to the leadership to ensure that we are on that roadmap, we are on the path for realizing uh, Vision 2047? I, I think I would like to uh, really conclude by one recommendation. I, I think a lot of the uh, uh, enablers have been identified. Work is happening on that. We have to stay focused on that and work out methods of accelerating. That's, that's to my mind, the most important uh, suggestion I would uh, comment I would make. All right, uh, Mr. Puri, it's been uh, great having you on the show. Thank you very much for uh, joining in. And once again, wish you a very happy Independence Day as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, with that, we come to the end of this special programming. It's a wrap from Ashmit, me and the entire team that has put this show together. Thank you very much for being with us. And once again, a very happy Independence Day to all the viewers.